Thumbs up if you see that. Thumbs up. All right. So live from COP27. Um, we always like to start things off with a land acknowledgement, especially when we are in a space where um, we are thinking about the voices and rights of, of marginalized communities um, uh, around the world. And the United Nations um, uh, has a statement on the rights of Indigenous peoples, which um, should be centered in the decisions that they make. Um, and um, is definitely something that is leading at COP this year as they discuss the um, loss and damage, which probably some of our um, uh, guests will talk about today. Um, we also, um, especially once again, also I think with this being an Africa COP, um, as they call it, because it is in Egypt, um, acknowledging that this country has actually been built on the backs of um, humans that uh, were brought, uh, not just brought, forced to come to this country from, from Africa um, and um, acknowledging that labor that went into that and also going back to loss and damage, what does reparations mean? What does um, it mean to um, acknowledge these past wrongs and pay pay it forward. Um, our organization, uh, we ignite, sustain the ability of educators, youth, and communities to act on systems perpetuating the climate crisis. And this COP program, we've been sending uh, delegations to COP since 2009. The folks that are joining us today, some are with climate generation, some are not. And for those of you that have no idea, you just came because you're like, what is COP and why are we talking about it? Um, COP is a conference that's happened 27 years in a row um, to try and solve the issue of climate change at a international level between 197, 198-ish different countries or parties. Obviously we haven't figured it out yet. Um, but they have been working towards it. I will say that one thing that I always, I don't know if it's comforting, but uh, like to think about is the decisions that are made at this level have to be made by consensus. And so if you think about it, anything that comes out of these meetings between 197 countries is pretty phenomenal. Um, we know that the... Um, major and important decisions and work that's being done is being done locally and regionally, um, sometimes nationally. And so these meetings are an opportunity to come and kind of, you know, highlight the really important things around the world. Um, but when we don't come away with like amazing progress, that doesn't mean we haven't been able to make progress in other places. Um, our organization and all of you all here in CLEAN that are doing education work um, is really focused on this idea of action for climate empowerment. And this is um, been called, it's called ACE um, short, and it comes out of the United Nations uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change. And it's the part of the work that recognizes that in order to actually accomplish any of this stuff, we need to have education and training and public participation, public awareness raising, network coordination, the stuff that we all do. This is the stuff that actually we need to accelerate that action and give it the push it needs to happen. And we were really excited this year to work with um, an artist who we met actually at COP last year who is helping us articulate some of the work that's happening at COP, some of the work of ACE through her visual illustrations. And so this is something that um, uh, she did for us in the buildup to COP, um, bringing together all the pieces of what is it, what does it mean to do ACE, be ACE? Um, and I will say that one of the reasons that we send people to these climate negotiations is um, a. It's really important to um, send the voices of youth, send the voices of our communities of color, our island nations, the folks who need to be centered in this, um, to these places and have their voices heard. It's also important for 
their voices to be heard. And that's them actually utilizing ACE. That's them actually implementing. What is ACE? It's actually participating, using your voice, educating others. Um, and then it's important for us to be look, thinking about how can we hold ourselves accountable to doing this work. And uh, we have friends in the policy realm that are doing a lot of work in that respect too. Um, that's actually asking that countries have to report out on their ACE work alongside with their greenhouse gas emission reduction, um, which I think is super exciting um, and sort of a pr progress towards that. So um, we have a delegation of 12 folks that are at COP um, six this week and six next week. Um, some of them are here with us, like I said, some of them are our partners um, and friends that are also at COP. And um, they are um, at the center of um, a couple of really key issues that I, I'm not gonna talk about. I'm just gonna highlight that human rights, loss and damage, and the centering of critical voices I mentioned is really, I think, a big theme. Um, we can talk about it more towards the end, and I'm sure you'll hear it as a theme and some of the things they're talking about too. Um, and uh, to start us off with just this arriving, we're in the first week of COP. This is from the, our graphic illustrator that we're working with. Um, her perception as she came into the COP, her view. Um, and we're going to kick it off with two guests that we have with us from Illinois that we had the pleasure of hooking up with and um, working with Greta Kringle and Fatima Perez, who um, are going to tell us more about It's Our Future and the organization that they work with in their high school. And then I have pictures and I can just go through them if you guys want to talk through them. So with that, introduce yourselves. Hi, everybody. Um, I am Greta Kringle. I'm a science teacher, environmental science, chemistry, and biology at Solorio Academy in Chicago, and also, um, I guess, a chaperone <laughs> on the It's Our Future uh, Youth Climate Activist uh, trip. And I'll let Fatima. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm Fatima. I am a senior at Solorio Academy High School, and uh, I'm here with It's Our Future, just exploring COP27. It's my first year ever. Um, so yeah, that's who I am. Yeah, same here. Um, so I think Fatima's story is probably more interesting than mine um, because, you know, the reason that we're here is really to get youth to um, explore their interests here at COP. Uh, and just learn a ton, which I'm also learning a ton, but I feel like I'm going to let Fatima start and then I will um, kind of fill in where I can. Yeah, okay, so. And then throw you under the bus. <laughs> the bus <laughs> um, no, so you mentioned like to, just to talk about our high school and like um, it's our future and like zero waste because zero waste is part of our high school. Um, so in terms of like my journey and like climate activism, I think like without me being aware of it, it started since I was young when I lived in Mexico because you live a different life there. And um, I'd say like, we were pretty sustainable in terms of like, we grew our own organic produce and we um, we were composting and like, you, you just, you're using like that food waste for like other stuff. And like, I was doing that already. I just didn't know it had that label. Um, and like, now that I think about it, I also think of, the community that I lived in and just like all the effects that come from climate change because there are a lot of like um, flooding and like overflowing from like bodies of water. There's a river near where I, my grandma used to live. Well, she still lives there, but <laughs> I don't know. I, I just, I haven't been there in a long time. Um, and also like, uh, like scarcity of water because they just recently had to like dug up another well trying to get water dug up multiple wells trying to get water um, until they finally got it. But like, that's just a struggle that my community where I lived in has also been struggling with. And now like transitioning to like high school, like obviously throughout, throughout middle school, I, I always knew this was an issue, uh, but I think my focus started um, probably, obviously I got introduced into zero waste as a freshman because it's has been implemented for a long time now. 
Um, and then I think I started becoming more interested in uh, sophomore year, but sophomore year was online. It was a weird time. So now like last year was when I joined Zero Waste and really started getting projects going with other my other peers um, and really just trying to uh, mobilize um, some policy with like CPS um, and trying to go plastic free in our cafeteria, but also sort of letting that trickle down to other schools. Um, and then this opportunity came across of like, hey, you can go to Egypt. Um, and that's how we got connected with our future. Well, technically through seven generations, which manages um, zero waste. And um, it was just a journey of like explaining to Rachel where I come from and why I'd be interested in coming in the first place. Um, and I luckily convinced Rachel, which I'm <laughs> super happy about. Thank you, Rachel, for giving me this amazing opportunity. <laughs> And now I'm here and like that's how I'm connected to um, It's Our Future Now and like we've been meeting the entire summer and like up until now just preparing, preparing for this event and I really hope to remain connected out throughout um, later in college because I think it's important to to sort of uh, have long term connections once you join a group right. Um, and in terms of my school, um, like I, I already mentioned like there's other really cool uh, students who are involved like my best friend just doing amazing things in, in our group as well. Um, and now that I'm a cop, yeah. It's, do, do you want to talk about your focus area? Oh yeah, I'll talk about my focus area. Backstory. Um, in terms of my focus area, I'm focusing on the impact of climate change and uh, the demographic of low income people, obviously coming from a low income background, but also thinking about sort of my ancestry um, from like living in Mexico, because I lived in Mexico, but obviously I'm Mexican. so I do have in a way con like ancestry um, for being an indigenous uh, indigenous person, right? In a way, um, I don't know much about it, but that's why I also want to connect more because I know that the town where my grandma settled was um, originally um, had a population of indigenous people, but they've sort of kind of moved away and, and, and the language was lost and the culture and story about it was lost, which is really sad for me because I wish I, I would have known more about it. So now I'm trying to kind of connect back to those roots by uh, learning about indigenous groups and how they're being impacted and what solutions they're um, trying to put at the forefront of climate the climate change fight, right? Um, so here, this picture, I'm here uh, with, um, she is a citizen from um, Tuvalu um, and she just shared her story on why she's here at COP and her, her very grounded stance in fighting for her country and refusing to become yet again a refugee um, because that's not that's not a solution that's just a consequence of climate change right um, so her story I talked about in um, my blog because I, I really thought it was it was super insightful it was just from the get-go because I, I wasn't even at the conference at this point yet um, so it was really great to talk to her um, kind of to get things going and to have a more um, specific perspective once I actually made it to the conference when I talked to other groups, which actually, um, yeah, that came back later. But here I am with a solar cooker, which was a super fun thing to learn about. Um, I knew it was probably possible. I just never, I've never seen a solar cooker. So it was just nice seeing one. Um, and here I have a picture of the pavilion, um, the, Afri the Africa pavilion which um, had a very interesting uh, panel yesterday as there was a president of Zimbabwe and uh, other African countries and just um, them discussing that um, African countries are truly ready with the workforce and the efforts and the solutions to move forward in the fight with climate change. It's just about uh, being properly financed by developed countries. Um, and by finance, that doesn't mean uh, developed countries coming to these underdeveloped countries and offering and proposing solutions because they already do have these solutions available. Um, so that's the story behind these pictures. And you could probably talk about these because I wasn't there. Yeah, so um, thank you, Fatima. Uh, so we have some other students here. Obviously, we're traveling with a group of five. Um, and uh, Antonio is our other student. And I've been with him most because we've been in the innovation zone and the green zone kind of on the outside. Um, and he is exploring energy solutions. Um, and I'm a science teacher, so I've really loved being able to kind of go around and um, 
film his interviews with him um, because it's just been really cool to see uh, the the innovation with energy that's happening. Um, and then also uh, we've been able to, um, it, we saw a lot of like the corporate side of it this morning, um, which was cool because the solutions are probably, you know, where we have to rely on the private sector um, for many of these things. And then we spent the afternoon um, conducting interviews in the academic um, tent in the green zone, uh, which was also um, amazing because this was actually where there were uh, people from Egypt, scientists from Egypt, um, walking Antonio and myself and Rachel through some pretty complicated science solutions that um, they were working on and implementing in um, in the university setting, and then also a you know, applying it in their, in their city, mostly Cairo. Um, so it, that, that was just like an awesome opportunity for me to like connect what I love science. Um, also get to see a student conducting these interviews and, and learning a lot, um, with his interest, um, in energy, but also, you know, like Antonio started the day, not knowing about hydrogen fuel, um, and, and ended up knowing, you know, a, a lot of the science and a lot of the, the issues and the obstacles to making that happen. Um, so just, you know, I think most of you out there are educators and we all love that like moment where you see your students, like things click and the amazement um, happens. And um, I've just had the opportunity to see that so many times um, and, and see it in this wide range of, applications from, you know, Microsoft <laughs> trying to tell us how they're going to solve all the problems of the world, um, then to like students that could be, you know, these kids in a few years um, developing their solutions in, in academia. And then uh, these pictures, uh, this was in front of the youth pavilion, the children and youth pavilion yesterday. Uh, but really, I think uh, the session started today. And I think I actually saw two people from Climate Gen in there today. I'm not sure if I'm mistaken, but I saw someone drawing like right in front of me, they were drawing the pavilion. And I thought it was super cool. I was like, oh, that's super cool. And who would have thought, yeah. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure uh, the, I think your name is Pooja. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right. You were there just kind of like getting things going, um, doing icebreakers, uh, which is so funny because you were like, turn to the right and talk to the person that's next to you. And I'm like, I already know the person there, but I talked to the person from the left. And um, yeah, it was cool to, to meet new people. And then here, the, this guy was just explaining the science behind the solar cookers. Awesome. I think those are the pictures I pulled out. Um, do you guys, can you stick on for a little bit? Still. Yeah, awesome. For sure. I have um, Eric is here and I know he has to head out sooner than later. So I was going to have him talk briefly through his picks before um, we move on to the next. Um, and so, Eric, while I scroll ahead to yours, go ahead and introduce yourself. Eric Passy is from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and one of Climate Gen's delegates. Hey, everybody. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep. Perfect. Okay, cool. Hey everyone, um, my name is Eric Posse. I am, um, as uh, Kristen mentioned, from Minnesota, Minneapolis. I um, am with a company called New Energy Equity. I've been in the clean energy space for over 10 years. Um, and so I'm kind of the wise millennial of the group, <laughs> um, but pa super passionate about the climate issue. My father was an immigrant from um, a place called Tonga which is a low-lying nation in the South Pacific. And um, I was able to, fortunate enough to visit there a handful of years ago and meet all sorts of wonderful people, including relatives for the first time and, uh, and uncle, cousins, first cousins. And um, it really reminded me that there's so much at stake with the climate issue. My father unfortunately passed away just a couple of years after that, but I have been, um, reconnecting with the Polynesian side of my family and um, especially here at COP. There are a lot of Polynesians, a lot of small island nations, 
and it's been super inspiring. Um, this is my first cop, and there are people, as you can imagine, from all over the world, uh, 190 plus countries. And some of the striking things that, that I've taken away is that there are people working on every facet of the climate issue across the globe. And, um, and, and in so many different, at so many different levels and very high levels. And, and so in my uh, professional life in clean energy and solar and, uh, specifically, um, I, I had a kick out of uh, several sessions today, including one about green hydrogen and renewable energy in Africa. And there was minister, uh, two ministers um, of, of energy from uh, Nambia as well as Morocco uh, talking about um, how Africa can kind of be an ex can be an exporter of energy and be a leader in, in green hydrogen. And I thought that was super interesting. Um, and, uh, you know, it's only really day, day three, but kind of day two, technically, um, in, uh, in, in the first week. So I have a few uh, photos here. Um, the first day that I visited on Sunday, uh, there were, there were two leaders from the Singapore pavilion that were putting on a youth hackathon, uh, where we were split into groups, uh, to develop a, a, to address a problem that we all saw as, as being a, a real issue and come up with a solution and propose that all within the span of about an hour and a half. And it was uh, my, so the picture in the middle, in the upper middle there is me, uh, Janara and uh, Liang. Janara is a, uh, world, a uh, world health um, professional from Egypt. And Liang is a photojournalist and um, and leader from from Singapore, uh, from Hong Kong. Sorry. And what we came up with, which is uh, coincidentally the same topic as other folks um, that were doing the hackathon, uh, and we had a few other pe people from Peru um, on our on our team as well, uh, was education related to the climate issue and, and what had prompted that, um, at least for me, was reading an article from November 1st in the New York Times stating that middle school students only receive two, on average two hours of climate education per year. And it is such, that's woefully inadequate to the issue that's, that's at hand. And we, you know, talked about how that leads to climate illiteracy and then inaction. Um, and what we developed as a group was talking about, and this is interesting because it's, it's uh, the same thing that, that climate generation is working on, um, is that climate is really inter interdisciplinary in that it touches everything from economics to political science, social science, foreign, uh, foreign studies, um, career training. And so if we were to even just treat uh, climate similarly in those areas of study, we would all of a sudden quintuple or more the amount of time that students are spending on climate. And they would learn the, the, the interwovenness of how this issue touches basically every part of the human experience or, or can. Um, and so that was really fun uh, day one and, and just meeting so many passionate young people um, kind of just re-inspired re me. Um, the picture at the bottom is the, the launch of the US Center, which was today. And I had the good fortune of uh, carving out, although not the best viewing area, but I was able to see John Kerry, um, who's the climate uh, czar essentially of, of the US speak. Michael Bloomberg, John Podesta, all talk today um, at this kind of small venue. And um, as John Kerry was kind of walking away, I was, I was kind of following him for a minute and uh, you hear journalists talk about loss and, and damage. And, and that's a huge topic um, right now at, at COP, um, which is all the affected nations, um, specifically 
um, poorer nations that are bearing the brunt of climate devastation are seeking, um, and not even necessarily seeking, but deserve um, compensation and, and, and payment for loss and damage. And it's uh, kind of a, a trending hashtag and something that you'll probably hear quite a bit about coming out of COP. Um, and so that was a really interesting moment. Um, and, and of course, you know, John Kerry scurried, scurried away uh, before he answered th those, those kind of pointed questions. But um, it's, it's a, again, an issue that, that we'll, we'll continue to hear a lot about. Um, on the upper right-hand corner is just kind of a walking through, uh, through the, um, the facilities in the blue zone. There are just countless numbers of murals, um, uh, pavilions, you know, which are essentially just huge um, trade show booths uh, that accommodate for all of these talking sessions, um, public talking sessions, and and uh, gathering places, um, and and uh, one of which. Uh, which is close to my heart in the bottom right hand corner is the picture of me in the Pacific Island, uh, or as they call it, the Moana Blue Pavilion. And uh, there I met a ton of other Polynesian people. And it was really heartening because I feel like in Minnesota, I'm a little bit on an island, so to speak, even though I'm in the middle of a, you know, a very landlocked in Minnesota. Um, but in terms of connecting with the Polynesian side of, of myself, um, there's just, you know, not a lot of people like me that are doing the same thing that I'm doing. And um, here at, at COP, it's, it's, everyone is contributing at such a high level. This morning, there was a, a, a declaration and they called it the Kioa Declaration, which um, was a summation of all the small island nations coming together to propose essentially a, a declare climate emer emergency on their own terms and in their own voices. And uh, it culminated with um, a really cool uh, um, performance um, that was led by the Tuvalu uh, delegation. And it was a traditional dance, but it was also kind of incorporating all these other really cool uh you know music and dance and it, it, it just it was uh I, I was fortunate enough to capture it um video uh but that obviously didn't make it here it's a big file um and and so that, that's just kind of the first three days and um i'm here with the climate action network this evening um at this really cool venue i'll kind of show you guys um and they're working on a, a lot of different things related to to cop this year's a little uh, different than other years in that um, obviously there's, you know, a hesitation to really um, do many uh, public um, uh, protests um, because of the government here. And um, that's, that's obviously under, understandable, um, but they're taking uh, very careful efforts to, to address opportunities within the Blue Zone, which is the UN essentially and outside of um, Egypt. Egyptian jurisdiction. Um, and then uh, earlier this evening, I met with other Minnesota people. And then later this evening, there's another um, networking opportunity. So just a lot of different things happening. And um, it's it's nonstop. And uh, got to drink a lot of water, get good sleep. Um, and yeah, it's been it's been a lot of fun. And it's only been three days. And so I, I do want to thank again, Climate Generation for their support um, in in uh, helping us get out here, um, because I do think it, it really does matter. And, and especially on, on the youth side, I, I, again, uh, being a wise millennial, um, you, you know, I have a, a slightly different perspective, but um, the youth do have a lot of uh, cachet at, at this point, um, and, and rightfully so. Um, no I, other kind of demographic has been more outspoken on climate recently, and um, they've made significant changes in, in, in the U.S. specifically, you know, um, no, you know, looking no further than the Sunrise Movement, obviously Greta Thunberg and uh, Fridays for Future. It's, it's, a, it's a massive movement that, that's being led by the youth, and um, it's, it's inspiring to see and, and hear their perspectives. So um, 
again, uh, thanks climate generation and, and, um, and hopefully I gave a little bit of insight into what's happening out here. With some great background music too, Eric. <laughs> thank, yeah, thank you. I know it's, 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 it's interesting. Sure. I feel like I'm there. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I know you might have to check out, but thanks for um, your reflections. Carolyn, I've got Absolutely. you all lined up here next if you want to go. Um, I'm going to scroll to your pictures. Sure. There we go. Cool. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Caroline, and I'm delighted to be here. I'm here on behalf of the Wild Center um, and the youth climate program there. Unfortunately, Jen had to hop off because they have their annual Adirondack Youth Climate Summit that starts tomorrow. But um, I think Gina is still here, and we have been doing that together since we were little middle schoolers. But anyway, um, and I'm also here um, on behalf of Clarkson University, which is where I'm doing my master's degree, and I'm working on stuff with uh, the US Green Building Council and their Lead for Communities program. So I'm kind of um, in part looking at a lot of ACE and education and youth related events, and in part looking at a lot of buildings and um, sustainable planning and like urban planning um, systems. Yeah. Um, Oh, so one of the first things that happened was I accidentally stumbled upon the Cornell booth and I w went to Cornell and I um, actually did the same class that the students here did and um, was able to go to COP in Poland, COP24. Um, and I sort of spent the day kind of helping them navigate the first day of COP, which is always really overwhelming. And it was obviously it was overwhelming for me too, because it's like chaotic and hard to find everything but it was it was really fun to to kind of be on the other side of that and and see who the new students are and their some of their work is similar to work I did so for that cop I was working on a paper on loss and damages for the kingdom of Tonga which um at the time loss and damages was much less salient than it is now and so it's really refreshing that it's being included in negotiations and really prioritized. And it's like a real buzzword at the COP this year, which is new to me, at least. I don't know how um, how it was last year, but it um, it's really nice to hear, um, to hear that. Um, I don't know what other pictures I included. Oh, cool. Speaking of Tonga, this is- um, Willy Louise. Yeah, yes. Um, and he is a Tongan, I guess he's an artist. I didn't meet him when I did originally did my pro project for Tonga, but he is um, associated with a lot of um, the same people that I worked with. And I had a great conversation with him where we, um, again, discussed how loss and damages is being discussed um, at this COP. Um, and it was also just a good example of how climate work is really, I mean, obviously this conference is huge and there's so many people doing amazing work around the world who do not have the privilege to be here, but it's also wonderful that these connections last and like, it's a good lesson in, I guess, just keeping up with people and making sure that you make a lasting impression so that you can, you know, be remembered and also like continue to do work across um, geographic boundaries, I guess. Um, this was just a picture of John Kerry at the um, Innovation Zone this morning. Um, and he was talking about the role of uh, the private sector in um, mitigation and adaptation, I guess. And he also um, spoke at the, at the opening of the US Center, which I was not at. So I'm not sure what his other policy priorities are this year, but I've seen him three times, which is really random. <laughs> Um, this was one of my favorite sessions I attended today. It was at the Climate Justice Pavilion. So this year is the first ever Climate Justice Pavilion, which has some, um, it's a bunch of different organizations have, have worked to put it on. Haley Krim, who I know a lot of you probably know is helping um, with that. And um, this was their opening event that had three of the most important voices in environmental justice in the U.S. Um, so Peggy Shepard from We Act for Environmental Justice and Beverly Wright, Dr. Beverly Wright and Dr. Um, Robert 
Bullard, who um, has written pretty much the foundational literature on environmental justice. Um, if you haven't read him, do, because he's incredible. And they were just really um, amazing and inspiring. And I just felt in awe to be in their presence. And they'll be here all week doing a bunch of different panels. So if two people who are here, if you miss this, like, go to things that have any of these three people, because they, like, Robert Bullard essentially invented and, like, in an academic sense, the concept of environmental justice. And so he's like very, very important. And it's a real honor and privilege to be able to hear from him. So that was amazing. Um, I don't remember what else I put, if there was anything else. Um, this is a three I got from you. OK, so I have a couple of other notes, which I would say are my general reflections so far. So first of all, I went to the Conference of Youth last week, which is meant to be a policy preparatory conference for young people and so youth as defined, excuse me, by the UN, so 18 to 30 or whatever. And um, I would say most of the people there, I would say are the, in their 20s, like mid 20s, early 20s. And it was 700 youth from 141 nations. And I would say I met maybe four other people from the US, which is, amazing because I feel like in these spaces United States the United States and like Europe are are always like really overrepresented and at the COI they call it the conference of youth it was that was not the case which was awesome and so I I had two roommates one from Bahrain and one from Greece and learned a whole lot from them and everyone else I met there and um I also learned kind of more about the structure of country delegations. And so a lot of the people who are at the COI are party delegates, members of their own country's delegation. And in the US, like we have a pretty antiquated and like kind of bureaucratic system of choosing our delegation. So it's always government and like negotiators for the government and not like civil society, young people, but, or um, even like members of, um, the private sector really and other nations have like all of these different interests especially a youth delegation or youth negotiators um, represented in their de delegation um, so I think that that's somewhere that the U.S. is like has a really strong presence here in terms of civil, civil society but it's really unfortunate that we're under not underrepresented we're just not represented at all in our own delegation um, what else um, yeah, I already mentioned that I am really pleased to see loss and damage being discussed everywhere and in, following those negotiations pretty closely because of my previous work with the Kingdom of Tonga. Um, and I hope that some sort of provision comes out of that and we'll see where that goes. And another really salient topic that I've noticed is nature, both in terms of nature-based solutions, but also in terms of nature loss and how nature loss not only is important ecologically, but also like financially and poses like trillion dollar risks to um, a lot of uh, countries like GDP in terms of, um, you know, natural resources and the equilibrium that we have from nature and all of these things are being discussed in like all of the different kinds of sessions I'm going to whether they're about like corporate like ESG or buildings or whatever um so that is awesome to hear and and um I've also heard a lot of intersections between this cop and the biodiversity cop which will be happening in December um and then the last thing is in terms of my work with cities and buildings. I went to a, a session that um, Greta also attended and a couple of our other delegates. And it was about um, the role of cities in in um, the future of the climate. And, and one of the things that um, really stuck with me was cities kind of as a laboratory for change and using like city and regional based governance to um, level up and inspire similar policies at the state level, at the federal level, or depending on, you know, what kind of government you have. Um, and yeah, so I think regional work, like if we're um, 
doing regional work sometimes can feel really alienated from the international climate policy space, but regional work is really important and can serve as like leveraging um, up into the higher levels of government. So yeah, those those are my my reflections so far. Awesome. Thanks, Caroline. Yeah, Thanks. thank you for yeah, I kind of like, uh, I just recruited Caroline online. Uh, I was like, I think you should come and speak for us. So thanks for jumping in. Happy um, to be here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And um, I think we have one more. Patty, yep, Patty's here. And I don't know if anyone else joined too, but um, Patty Bourne, I'd love to introduce too. We are working together on um, Hamlin University and Climate Gen have launched a climate literacy certificate, which we're really excited about. And one of the things I'm doing right now is teaching a undergrad and grad course climate policy and solutions through COP, um, during COP, which is fun through Hamlin. And Patty is over in Egypt too and has no pics, but she has words. And she That's has no right. luggage either. So, right. <laughs> Sorry, I have no pics. I took some on my phone and I was hoping to be able to shoot them your way, but I didn't get back here in time. But yeah, I'm, um, for me, this is day one and uh, it's my second cop and it's slightly overwhelming for me just because it's been sort of a chaotic arrival. Um, so I was only in the blue zone for a short time. Today, I poked my head into a couple of things, but was sort of just trying to get my bearings. Um, but something that I've been really struck by is, again, I know a lot of folks have mentioned this already, but just the number of young people is really exciting to me and really inspiring and humbling. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. And then something that I've been thinking about a lot since I got on the ground was a conversation I had on the plane ride over here, um, the flight from New York to Zurich. And I was uh, having a conversation with someone who's here with the U.S. delegation and um, works, you know, in a lot of the negotiation rooms and kind of high level stuff. Um, and I, you know, I'm just, a, I'd like to call myself a wise Gen Xer, but I don't know if I've reached the wise part. <laughs> but um, so one thing that really struck me about that conversation was that the uh, person that I was talking to said, you know, I keep hearing this thing called um, climate anxiety. I keep hearing people talk about how the youth are really struggling with climate anxiety. Is that really a thing? And um, I said, yeah, it's absolutely a thing. I hear about it all the time in my work with undergrads and graduate students and um, even younger folks. I have two teenagers of my own who are certainly have climate anxiety. And so I've been thinking about where that fits into this bigger conversation. Um, how are we addressing that as part of our job as educators? What does that look like and feel like and sound like in different um, places? And I'm not, you know, I don't have any answers to that, but it's something that I think is a really important part of the conversation we are having about <clears throat> climate literacy and education, but also kind of, um, alongside that climate literacy or that uh, climate anxiety that folks are feeling is the need for us to make spaces for joy and those feelings of hope and optimism that I think can quickly get sort of swept away in the chaos and the worry and the anxiety and everything and just thinking about how are we as educators showing up and helping make room in young people's lives and our own lives and the lives of others for that hope and optimism again. I think that's so critically important right now. So that's what I'm going to be thinking a lot about as I attend a bunch of different education settings. I have um, several little notes scattered everywhere right now of different sessions that I'm planning on attending in the next couple of days. And I'm really hoping that I can get the, the timing to align for, so that I can do all the things I want to do. But I know, I know from experience, that's kind of a tall warrior. So I'll just do the best I can. But thanks um, for hosting this. It's really great to be a part of this. Awesome. Thanks, Patty. Yeah. Is there any questions that people have? I think this is the last person we had that was able to join us. Um, I can. Um, can I just jump in briefly, Kristen? Oh, go ahead. Who's? Yeah, yeah go. It's yeah, go ahead. Well, Rachel, yeah. yeah. Um, well, <clears throat> I just wanted to echo Patty's comments uh, about the. Um, 
the emotional component and, and our it's our future youth will tell you that I'm always bringing up that that let's you know in this world that's so about science and policy and data it's so critical to uh, make space for feelings and connection and, and for sure the fun and joy so I appreciate you mentioning that um, I also wanted to just say it's our future is um, Chicago based uh, program we brought five high school students and uh, they have been doing an amazing job of interviewing uh, uh, other leaders, delegates, other youth, and um, that's posted on our social media and a dispatch similar to the climate generation. We're doing that next live stream. Um, and then when they go back, they will um, kind of use their clout of having been here to then go speak mm -hmm. at their school boards and city council meetings, et cetera, to try and really affect change in their community. So that's exciting. Um, and uh, back to uh, Greta's slide, it was a ways back there, but that was um, Antonio interviewing John Podesta and students got to see John Kerry as well speaking today, which is amazing. And um, I think those are my big things. And, and we, we, did, we did go snorkeling, um, those of us who couldn't get into blue the <laughs> other day, which was phenomenal, so, okay. Awesome. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah, and I wanted to point out, so all the students that um, It's Our Future has brought will be doing a webcast on, I think it's actually at 11 our time. I'll have to check that out. Is it at 11? Our, I've know. been telling people 12. So. Okay, yeah. it's, I think it's at 12. It's 11 next week. So on, on Thursday this week, um, and we can put the link in the chat, but I'm really excited to hear from all the students. Um, and if you want to do some following, I see Ingrid has her um hand up go for it Ingrid I'm going to stop sharing my screen yeah I had a question um I have a colleague who went to COP26 last year and she said that um a message she heard over and over again from talking with people from developing countries was they felt they they lacked capacity to take action um, so that even if they had funding, they didn't have the capacity, uh, meaning like they didn't have people who were trained in various fields to be able to implement solutions. But I think I heard maybe from, maybe it was one of the original speakers here, but they were hearing the opposite message that people felt they had the capacity to act, they just needed the funding. So it could be just maybe you were, you know, talking to different people, so hearing different messages, or I'm wondering if there's been kind of a shift in the message if people feel they have the capacity to act now, they just need financial help. I'm curious about that. I could maybe speak to that kind of having been part of a delegation at COP24 that was like um, meant to be a capacity building initiative. And I know that like those kinds of initiatives continue where universities or what have you, research institutions partner with delegations that are smaller in order to increase their capacity, but also I don't know if it's necessarily a shift in need as much as it's a shift in acknowledgement that a huge, the huge component of capacity building is not always human capacity as much as it's funding. And I think like funding is a measure of capacity building that, um, is often kind of overlooked. We're like, oh, if we just like, you know, help help them do research, then it'll be okay. But I think people need funding and a lot of them have, as Fatima mentioned, like have the solutions and just don't have the ability to implement them. Deborah, did you have a question? Um, thank you so much for letting me participate. I would love to get um, the perspective, and I believe uh, Greta and Fatima might be the best um, insight into this. Um, Fatima, you probably know from your teacher from ecology, there's many different um, inputs, and it's not always top-down, predator, consumer, giving um, a large, um, source to someone else. And I was so interested in your background in both uh, Mexico and indigenous knowledge. Um, and you're in Egypt where 
before Microsoft and before the World Bank, there were a lot of solutions and a lot of from the ground up accessible solutions. Are you finding um, local doable overlap, crossover, compare and contrast, maybe from Mexico to Egypt of what people have always done for thousands of years in countries that are hot and don't have so much water? <laughs> And are you are you are you finding solutions and you know respect for things that have worked before? On your own? Um, yeah, I'd say in in terms of like I I went to one of the booths where uh, there's an organization from the United States um, called the Climate Justice Alliance, which connects a lot of indigenous organizations across the United States. Um, specifically, also they're connected to an organization. Of indigenous people in little village which is in chicago where i live um and i mean some of those solutions are just like having food security and and being able to like you know grow your own food that's organic and um like just sort of that which i also like saw in mexico maybe not through indigenous people anymore because they've been displaced um but like there's a lot of like everyday things that happen that are helpful um but also just in terms of like um, like there's uh, an urgency from indigenous people to not, well, it's obviously to a certain extent great to involve the private sector because ultimately they have to provide the funding for some of these solutions. But um, I think what comes, what instills fear in indigenous, in indigenous people and what sometimes makes them so against the help from the private sector is that the, the private sector becomes involved and they become involved in the, in the creation of the solutions which often can just become more damaging um, and just become basically another way to um, to bolster capitalism, right? Um, which is just terrible because then they're not actually solving anything. It's just for the mere purpose of profit. Um, so I think that's what I have to say. There was a, a, a common theme that I saw across indigenous uh, people's mentality of like, we don't necessarily want the private sector to be at the forefront of this. They they are helpful, but in, in a sense, they have to be listening to indigenous voices. That's the way that they should help. Yeah. Frank, did you have a question or did he disappear? Oh, there you are. No, I, I, I just was I'm I sensitive to time. <laughs> no, 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 he's still here. Um, so, uh, my question is, is just as you go through the, the time there, um, one of the things in the United States we're looking at is this idea of capacity. Um, we're starting to see that the when you scale up the solutions, there just aren't enough people who have the skills to meet the urgency and scale of deployment. And, I, and I'm hearing this implementation or deployment or and the, the shift from negotiation to implementation. But when we get to implementation, there's just not enough people who have the skills to do the work. And I'm just curious as to, are you seeing that? And I, I can be really like, I'm talking like specific stuff like electricians, just straight up electricians, um, HVAC technicians. I mean, there's my HVAC system right there. Um, it's a technical uh, system. You know, the solar installer put that up there. I'm sorry, I'm in my house. So, I mean, but the, that that technical mechanical stuff um, is a critical piece of, of, of a good chunk of this work, but are, is that conversation showing up? Because that kind of capacity building is very different than, you know, negotiation capacity building or other things like that. So just, I'm just curious if that's, that's is practical stuff. I love that question. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I also love that question. And I realize it actually does. I, so today being mostly in the innovation zone, hearing um, about all these kind of grand uh, private sector plans for all these um, alternative energy solutions, um, no one brought up <laughs> like apprenticeships, training programs, um, so th that was definitely. Uh oh, it looks like those guys froze the internet uh -oh. here. A little wacky. Um, 
and I can't totally pick up where Greta left off. Do I you want to go? Could, yeah. I mean, I think that probably what she was getting <laughs> at is, is, <laughs> is that, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I haven't heard, I've been to a lot of sessions. I kind of, as for this first day on a variety of topics, like with varying degrees of relevance to my actual field, just because it's like fun to explore these things. And in, in any of these types of discussions, I have not heard any discussion of like, how do we train people to implement these solutions? And like, if we're going to technology our way out of this, like who's going to do that? And how many people are going to do that? And where do we get them? And what field do they currently work in? And do we and transfer teach them? Fossil fuels? Like it's just, I think it's a just transition topic specifically. So I'll try to, to hone in on that and maybe have a better answer, hopefully by the end of the week. And well, I think Patty, what well, Patty just said is actually a critical piece, right? Who teaches them? Like yeah. these things don't happen by themselves. So Patty, I heard you. Yeah, and I hang out in a lot of higher ed spaces and that conversation rarely comes up. The trade and apprenticeship, the you know, the green jobs track is not very, it's not talked about nearly enough. And I, I mean, every job is a green job, right? Teaching is a green job. They're all green jobs. But, but I think specifically what you're talking about is something that doesn't get due time and at least not in the higher ed conversations that I'm spending time in. But I will try to start talking about it more because I think it's a really important question. Um, I'm mindful of the time, but oops. Yeah, I wanted to, I noticed that Manolo is on the call. He's also uh, here and, and um, he's got a real, he, one student who showed up because he's got a real passion for climate education and he's actually even doing a podcast on the subject oh, cool. um i just yeah do you want to just say hi manolo and he's going to be on uh, the live stream on thursday yeah. <laughs> yeah. awesome hey manolo we're we are excited to hear from you on thursday right you'll be there thursday yeah yes i will i'm excited too Awesome. We're excited to hear from you on Thursday because that's my favorite topic too. Um, conscious of it being 104 and we try to end at one. I And it's bedtime for our Egyptian friends. <laughs> um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining today. And um, I look forward to following you all and see you again on Thursday and seeing those blogs. And if you, anyone else has any other questions, um, please follow up with us as well. So thanks everyone. Have a great day. Bye.